The Bruce Partington Plans by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, dramatised by Grant Eustace, with Roy Marsden as Sherlock Holmes and John Moffat as Dr. Watson. Down the eagle like the patch of gold. Look at that. I'm not seeing things, am I? That is a dead body there beside the line, isn't it? In the third week of November, in the year 1895, a dense fog settled upon London. From the Monday to the Thursday, I doubt whether it was ever possible from our windows in Baker Street to see the opposite houses. By the fourth day, my friend Sherlock Holmes could endure this drab existence no longer. He paced restlessly about our sitting room, chafing against inaction. The London criminal is certainly a dull fellow. Hmm. Look out of this window, Watson. Hmm? The thief or the murderer could roam the city on such a day as the tiger does the jungle, unseen until he pounces, and then evident only to his victim. Hmm. Is there nothing in the paper? Well, there have been numerous petty thefts. Oh, the great and sombre stage is set for something more worthy than that. It is fortunate for this community that I am not a criminal. <laughs> it is indeed. It was the arrival of a telegram that broke the monotony. Well, well, what next? Brother Mycroft is coming round. Well, why not? Why not? It is as if you met a tramcar coming down a country lane. Mycroft has his rails and he runs on them. Once and only once he's been here. Well, what upheaval can possibly have derailed him? Does he not explain? Scarcely. Um, read for yourself. Sherlock, must see you over Cadogan West. Coming at once, Mycroft. Cadogan West? Now, I've heard the name. Oh, it recalls nothing to my mind. Uh, uh, by the way... Do you know what Mycroft is? You told me that he had some small office under the British government. Mm, yes, well, that's correct. But it would also be right, in a sense, to say that occasionally he is the British government. Oh, my dear Holmes. Oh, I thought it might surprise you. Mycroft remains a subordinate, as no ambitions will receive neither honour nor title, but remains the most indispensable man in the country. But how? By being a clearinghouse of facts. The conclusions of every department are passed to him, and he is the central exchange which makes up the balance. In that great brain of his, everything is pigeonholed and can be handed out in an instant. So what I wonder is, could Dugan West to Mycroft? I've read it, I know. Um, here. Ah, yes, yes, here it is. Cadogan West was the young man found dead on the underground on Tuesday morning. Mm, a death which has caused my brother to alter his habits can be no ordinary one. What can he have to do with it? The case was featureless, as I remember it. There's been an inquest, and a good many fresh facts have come out. Well, then, let's have them. Arthur Cadogan West was 27, unmarried, and a clerk at Woolwich Arsenal. Government employee. Behold the link with Brother Mycroft? Ah, mm. <laughs> He left Woolwich suddenly on Monday night. Was last seen by his fiancée, Miss Violet Westbury, whom he left abruptly in the fog about 7.30 that evening. There was no quarrel between them, and she can give no motive for his action. It begins to get more interesting. The next thing heard of him was when his dead body was discovered by a plate layer just outside Olgate Station. In what condition? The head was badly crushed, an injury which might well have been caused by a fall from the train. The body could only have come on the line in that way. Had it been carried down, it must have passed the station barriers. Well, the case is definite enough. The man, dead or alive, either fell or was precipitated from a train. So much is clear. Yeah, the trains which traverse the lines of rail beside which the body was found run from west to east on the Metropolitan Line. It can be stated for certain this young man was travelling in this direction at some late hour of the night, but at what point he entered the train it is impossible to state. His ticket would show that. Ah, but there was no ticket in his pocket. Oh, dear me, Watson, this is really very singular. In my experience, it is not possible to reach the platform of a metropolitan train without exhibiting one's ticket. 
Um, was there any sign of robbery? Um, no, apparently not. Ah, there's a list here of his possessions. Purse, mm. checkbook, theatre tickets, ah. packet of technical papers. Well, there we have it at last, Watson. The chain to Brother Mycroft is complete. Ah. It was only a moment later that the tall and portly form of Mycroft Holmes was ushered into the room. His was a most unwieldy frame, but above it there perched a head so masterful in its brow, so alert in its eyes, and so subtle in its expression, that after the first glance one forgot the gross body and remembered only the dominant mind. At his heels came our old friend Lestrade of Scotland Yard. Morning, Mr. Holmes. Good morning. A most annoying business, Sherlock. In the present state of Siam, it is most awkward that I should be away from the office. But it is a real crisis. Have you read up the case? Uh, we have just done so. What were the technical papers? Ah, there's the point. The papers which this wretched youth had in his pocket were the plans of the Bruce Partington submarine. Surely you've heard of it. Only as a name. Its importance can hardly be exaggerated. You may take it from me that naval warfare becomes impossible within the radius of a Bruce Partington's operation. The plans were kept in an elaborate safe in a confidential office adjoining the arsenal with burglar-proof doors and windows. Under no conceivable circumstances were the plans to be taken from the office. And yet here we find them, in the pockets of a dead clerk in the heart of London. And apparently killed in an accident. But you have recovered the papers. No, Sherlock, we have not. Ten were taken from Woolwich. There were seven in the pockets of Cadogan West. The three most essential have gone. You must drop everything, Sherlock. And never mind your usual petty puzzles of the police court. Why do you not salvage yourself, Mycroft? You can see as far as I am. Possibly, Sherlock. But to run here and there, to cross-question railway guards, lie on my face with a lens to my eye, that is not my métier. <laughs> uh, well, the problem certainly presents some points of interest, and I shall be pleased to look into it. The line the conversation then took was to establish who had access to the papers. Only two people had a key to the safe. One was the official guardian of the papers, Sir James Walter, the other was the senior clerk. Both had witnesses to say they had been nowhere near the confidential office after the papers had been locked away for the night. The only conclusion was that Cadogan West had used false keys to obtain the papers. Inspector Lestrade stated it in his usual unvarnished way. It seems to me perfectly clear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He took the papers to sell them. He saw the agent. They could not agree as to price. He started home again, but the agent went with him. In the train, the agent murdered him, took the more essential papers and threw his body from the carriage. Why had he no ticket? Ah, <laughs> the ticket would have shown which station was nearest the agent's house. Therefore, he took it from the murdered man's pocket. Good, Lestrade, very good. <laughs> Your theory holds together. But if it is true, then the case is in an end. Mm -hmm. The traitor is dead and the plans are presumably already on the continent. No, Sherlock. All my instincts are against this explanation. If Cadogan West had made an appointment with a foreign agent, he would have kept his evening clear. Instead, he took two tickets for the theatre, escorted his fiancée halfway there, and then suddenly disappeared. A blind. A very singular one. Uh, well, 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 we shall see. Come, Watson. Yes. And Lestrade, hmm? could you favour us with your company for an hour or two? I shall let you have a report before evening, Mycroft. An hour later, Holmes, Lestrade and I stood upon the underground railway at the point where it emerges from the tunnel before Aldgate Station. This is where the young man's body was discovered. Have the carriages been examined for any sign of violence? Yes, and there are no such signs. Well, whatever is the matter, Mr. Holmes? The points. What of it? What do you mean? Points and a curve. What is it, Mr. Holmes? Have you some clue? An indication, no more. Uh, but the case certainly grows in interest. I do not see any indication of bleeding on the line. Oh, uh, there were hardly any. But there was a considerable wound. Oh, the bone was crushed, but there was no great external injury. And yet one would have expected some bleeding. Yes, yes. 
Would it be possible for me to inspect the trains from which he might have fallen? Ah, oh, fear not, Mr. Holmes. They've been broken up and the carriages redistributed. Ah, well then we have done all we can here. We parted from Lestrade and made our way to London Bridge. There, Holmes dispatched a telegram to Mycroft, asking him to send to Baker Street details of any international agents known to be in London. Then we took a train to Woolwich. We suddenly owe Brother Mycroft a debt for having introduced us to what promises to be a really very remarkable case. I'm dull indeed not to have understood its possibilities. Even now they are dark to me. Well, the end is dark to me also, but I've hold of one idea which may lead us far. The man met his death elsewhere, and his body was on the roof of a carriage. On the roof? Remarkable, is it not? But consider the facts. Is it a coincidence that the body is found at the very place where the train sways as it comes round the point, where an object on the roof might be expected to fall off? And the question of the blood. There will be no bleeding on the line if the body has bled elsewhere. And the ticket, too. Exactly. It would explain the absence of a ticket. Mm. Everything fits together. Our first call, once we'd arrived at Woolwich, was to the fine villa of Sir James Walter. But we were not prepared for the news that awaited us when we were ushered into the drawing room to meet Colonel Valentine Walter. I am afraid, gentlemen, I have to tell you that my brother is dead. Oh. I am sorry to hear it. Please accept our condolences. Oh, yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. It was this horrible scandal. My brother was a man of very sensitive honour. It broke his heart. We had hoped that he might have given us some indications which would have helped us. I assure you that it was all a mystery to him, as it is to you and to all of us. You cannot throw any new light upon the affair? I know nothing myself, save what I've read or heard. I have no desire to be discourteous, but you can understand, Mr. Holmes, that I must ask you to hasten this interview to an end. This is indeed an unexpected development, Watson. It certainly is. Mm. Was the death natural, I wonder? Or did the poor old fellow kill himself in self-reproach for duty neglected? Mm. Now, let us see what we can learn from the Cadogan Wests. The bereaved mother was too dazed with grief to be of any use to us, but at her side was a white-faced young lady, Miss Violet Westbury, the fiancée of the dead man. I cannot explain it, Mr. Holmes. Arthur was the most single-minded, chivalrous, patriotic man on earth. He would have cut his right hand off before he would sell a state secret confided to his keeping. But the facts, Miss Westbury? I admit I cannot explain them. Was he in want of any money? No. No sign of any mental excitement? What? Come, Miss Westbury, be absolutely frank with us. Yes. I had a feeling that there was something on his mind. For long? Only for the last week or so. Once I pressed him about it. It is too serious for me to speak about. Even to you, he said. I could get nothing more. Go on, Miss Westbury. Even if it seems to tell against him, go on. I have little more to tell. He once said how slack we were about such matters as secrets, that it would be easy for a traitor to get the plans. Mm -hmm. right, now tell us of last evening. We were to go to the theatre. The fog was so thick that a cab was useless. We walked, and our way took us close to the office. Suddenly, he darted away into the fog. Without a word? He gave an exclamation. That was all. Oh, Mr. Holmes... If you could only save his honour, it was so much to him. It was black enough before against this young man, but our inquiries make it blacker, Watson. His intended marriage gives a motive for wanting money. The idea was in his head since he spoke about it. He nearly made the girl an accomplice in the treason by telling her his plans. It's all very bad. Oh, but surely Holmes' character goes for something. And then again... Why should he leave the girl in the street and dart away to commit a felony? Mm, yes, there are certainly objections. But it is a formidable case which they have to meet. Our last call was at the office where the plans were kept. It confirmed what we already knew and told us nothing else. But one more piece of information did come our way at Woolwich Station. The clerk in the ticket office was able to say with confidence that he saw Cadogan West 
whom he knew well by sight, upon the Monday night, and that he went to London by the 8.15 to London Bridge. The clerk was struck at the time by his excited and nervous manner. A reference to the timetable showed that the 8.15 was the first train which it was possible for West to take after he had left Violet Westbury about 7.30. As we returned to London, Holmes continued to analyse all that we had so far learned. Is there a hypothesis that would place Cadogan West in rather a better light? Let us suppose that he'd been approached by a foreign agent. He rejects him, but it preys on his mind. And then on the way to the theatre, he sees the same man, follows him to the office, sees him steal the plans, pursues him. Yes, but what follows? Uh, uh, yes, well, then we come into difficulties. Why not seize the villain and raise the alarm? Because he is West's superior. Hmm. Our sense starts to run cold here, and there's a vast gap between the 815 from Woolwich and West's body with seven papers in his pocket on the roof of a metropolitan train. My instinct now is to work from the other end. A note awaiting us at Baker Street from Mycroft enabled Holmes to do that. Of the three names and addresses of foreign agents that it contained, one in particular caught his attention. He spread out his big map of London and leaned eagerly over it. Well, well, things are turning a little in our direction at last. Why, Watson, I do honestly believe that we are going to pull it off after all. Oh? I, um, I'm going out now. It's only a reconnaissance. I will do nothing serious without my trusted comrade and biographer at my elbow. <laughs> I waited for his return, filled with impatience. At last, shortly after nine o'clock, there arrived a messenger with a note. Watson, I'm dining at Goldini's restaurant, Gloucester Road, Kensington. Please come at once and join me there. Bring with you a jemmy, a dark lantern, a chisel and a revolver. S.H. <laughs> it was a nice equipment for a citizen to carry through the fog-draped streets. When I reached the garish Italian restaurant... I found my friend sitting at a little round table near the door. You had something to eat? Um, well, I... Oh, and then try one of the proprietor's cigars. Mm -hmm. yeah, they are less poisonous than one would expect. Hmm. Have you the tools? Uh, yes, they are here, in my overcoat. Oh, excellent. And let me give a short sketch of what I have done and what we're about to do. Now, it must be evident to you, Watson, that this young man's body was placed on the roof of the train. Well, could it not have been dropped from a bridge? Oh, I should say it's impossible. If you examine the roofs, you will find that they're slightly rounded, and there is no railing around them. Well, how could he be placed there? Well, the underground runs clear of tunnels at some places in the West End. I have a vague memory that as I travel, I have occasionally seen windows just above my head. Suppose that a train halted under such a window there will be no difficulty in laying a body upon the roof. Mm, but it, it, it sounds most improbable. Well, we must fall back upon the old axiom that when all other contingencies fail, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Mm? Yes. Yes, well, here all other contingencies have failed. And I should add, the leading international agent in London lives in a row of houses which abuts the underground. Oh, that's what you found on your map? Uh, that was it. Hugo Oberstein of 13 Caulfield Gardens became my objective. A very helpful official at Gloucester Road Station walked with me along the track. Not only did the back stair windows of Caulfield Gardens open onto the line, owing to the intersection there, the underground trains are frequently held motionless for some minutes at that very spot. Splendid, Holmes. You've got it. Oh, well, only so far, Watson. I have only seen the outside. There is no one to open the door from the inside. So we must make alternative arrangements. Yes, but uh, could we not get a, a warrant and legalise it? Well, hardly on the evidence. Now, what can we hope to do? Well, we cannot tell what correspondence may be there. Mm. It's, I don't like it, Holmes. My dear fellow, you should keep watching the street. I'll do the criminal part. Well, it's not a time to stick a trifle. Yes. Yes, you're right, Holmes. We are bound to go. Oh, I, I knew I could rely upon you. Mm. Now, it's nearly half a mile, but there is no hurry. Let us walk. Don't drop the instruments, I beg. Your arrest as a suspicious character will be a most unfortunate complication. Mm -hmm. The fog still hung about and screened us. 
When we reached the house, we soon discovered that the massive front door was bolted as well as locked. The lower door, however, resisted Holmes for only a minute before it flew open. And we were inside. An uncarpeted stair took us up to a window. Here we are, Watson. This must be the one. <clears throat> oh, you see how close the trains come. Yeah. Look here. These smears in the soot on the windowsill. This is where they rested the body. As Holmes swept his light along the windowsill, it revealed more. There were discolorations on the woodwork that were undoubtedly blood. And here, on the stair as well. Now, now we've only to stay here until a train stops and the demonstration is complete. We had not long to wait. The very next train roared from the tunnel as before, but slowed in the open and then, with a creaking of brakes, pulled up immediately beneath us. It was not four feet from the window ledge to the roof of the carriages. So far we're justified. What do you think of it, Watson? A masterpiece. Oh, no, 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 I cannot agree with you there. Our difficulties are still before us. Uh, but perhaps we may find something here which may help us. It proved a long and nearly fruitless search. But after an hour, we found a small tin cash box with some newspaper cuttings in it. A record of a series of messages in the advertisements of a newspaper. By the print and paper, the Daily Telegraph agony column, and all signed by Piero. Huh. Oh, well, perhaps it won't be so difficult after all. There is nothing more to be done here, Watson. I think we might drive round to the offices of the Daily Telegraph and bring a good day's work to a conclusion. Right. Mycroft Holmes and Inspector Lestrade came round to Baker Street the following morning, and Holmes recounted to them our proceedings of the day before. Burglary! Oh, no wonder you get results that are beyond us, Mr. Holmes. But one of these days you'll go too far and you'll find yourself and your friend in trouble. Ah, martyrs on the altar of our country, eh, Watson? Mm. <laughs> uh, but what do you think, Mycroft? Excellent, Sherlock, admirable. But what use will you make of your knowledge? Have you seen Piero's advertisement today? Oh, another one? Yes, here it is. Tonight, same hour, same place, most vitally important. Your own safety at stake, Piero. By George, if he answers that, we've got him! That was my idea when I put it in. <laughs> I would suggest eight o'clock tonight at Caulfield Gardens, gentlemen, if that is convenient. Lestrade and Mycroft met us outside Gloucester Road Station. The lower door of Oberstein's house had been left open the night before, but as Mycroft Holmes absolutely and indignantly declined to climb the railings, it was necessary for me to go in and open the main door. By nine o'clock, we were all seated in the study, waiting patiently. It was after eleven before Holmes sat up suddenly. He is coming. The man came into the house, and as soon as his dark figure passed us, Holmes shut the door and stood with his back to it. Lestrade lit the lamp. There, looking at us in astonishment, was the younger brother of the late Sir James Walter, the head of the submarine department. It was Colonel Valentine Walter. Well, well. What is this? I came here to visit Mr. Oberstein. Everything is known, Colonel Walter. What? You took an impress of the keys your brother held. You entered into correspondence with Oberstein, who answered you through the advertisement columns. You were seen and followed here by Cadogan West when you took the papers. And then you added the crime of murder to that of treason. I did not. Before God, I swear it was Oberstein. Tell us, then. Cadogan West followed me to the door. When Oberstein opened it, West suddenly came out of the fog and confronted us. Oberstein carries a life preserver. West was dead five minutes after Oberstein struck him. As the West was placed on the underground train, after Oberstein had put on his body all but the three most important papers you had brought him. Yes. It's not too late for you to make reparation. How? Where is Oberstein? I can reach him in Paris. I will then sit at this desk and write to my dictation. It is a matter of history that the message that Holmes invented about an essential detail of the Bruce Partington plans that was missing, lured Oberstein back to London. He still had with him the missing papers, 
which he had put up for auction in Europe. He spent the next 15 years regretting his folly in a British prison. Some weeks afterwards, I learned, incidentally, that Holmes spent a day at Windsor, whence he returned with a remarkably fine emerald tie pin. Oh, it's just a present from a certain gracious lady in whose interest I've carried out a small commission. But I fancy that I could guess at that lady's august name and that Holmes would take especial care of such a regal type in. In The Bruce Partington Plans by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Roy Marsden played Sherlock Holmes, John Moffat, Dr. Watson, Roger Hammond, Mycroft Holmes, Sean Barrett, Colonel Valentine Walter, Steve Hodson, Inspector Lestrade, and Betsy Blatchley, Violet Westbury. The Bruce Partington Plans was dramatised by Grant Eustace and directed by Michael Bartlett for Daedalus Productions. <laughs>